So today uh, we are thrilled really to host um, Dr. Ang Lim Go uh, from HPE. Um, he is a senior uh, vice president um, uh, for value from data and AI for customers as principal investigator uh, of the experiment aboard the International Space Station to operate autonomous supercomputers on long duration space travel. He was awarded NASA's Exceptional Technology Achievement Medal. His other work include co-inventing blockchain-based swarm learning applications for finance and healthcare, which was featured on the cover of Nature, overseeing deployment of AI to Formula One racing, industrial application of technologies behind a champion poker bot, co-designing the system's architecture for simulating a biologically detailed mammalian brain, predicting predisposition, predisposition to vaccine side effects by machine learning, of gene expression data and co-inventing a data intensive fabric for exascale systems. Extracting value from data is one common factor of all the above. He has 11 uh, US patents of which four are environmental, social governance related and plus two other pending. When you look at you know, the biography, you realize that you know, HPC is everywhere, right? And today, uh, you know, we're really excited to have uh, Dr. Ang Lim go. He's going to talk about a very timely topic, generative AI, disruptions and implications for institutions, enterprises, and society. Dr. Ang Lim go, please take it away. Thank you. I'll, I'll share my screen, yeah? Sure. I'm stop sharing. All yours. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eng Lim, as uh, uh, Hatem mentioned, uh, last name Go. I'm, uh, I, I've been with, uh, I was with, with SGI, Silicon Graphics, for, and before that, right? Uh, during that time, the early days, uh, SGI and, and Cray were together uh, before Cray was spun off again. And I was with uh, SGI 27 years, including uh, the period with Cray. Um, and um, I was CTO for, for half of that time, yeah. And, and about five, six years ago, HPE acquired uh, SGI, and I came along with it. And then subsequently, HPE acquired Cray. So we are now all to back together again, right? You know, the thing uh, in this industry, so sometimes, you know, you, you, you come back together again, right? We were together, we, then we went our, our different ways, and we are back together again. But the focus has been uh, always silicon, gra uh, silicon graphics, Cray, HPE, you know, that, that combination has been on supercomputing. And, and it turns out uh, that uh, we have now a, a, a brilliant next big use case, right, uh, for, for supercomputing. So this is the topic to, to get today, generative AI. You know, we, we at HPE, I myself, don't develop the, the large language models. That's the foundation of, uh, of uh, generative AI. Um, but what we do is uh, we run those models efficiently, productively, effectively, and then scale them and and then deploy them. Uh, it's very similar, similar, same same things we do uh, with uh, simulation based uh, supercomputing, right? So essentially, we've gone from rules based prediction, physics, mathematics, CFD, finite element analysis, rules based prediction, to uh, data based uh, prediction. That's, uh, that's uh, machine learning uh, generative, uh, leading to generative AI, yeah. As I always say, the link is uh, from data, a machine learns to be artificially intelligent. That's how I link the three together. Of course, an AI system could be uh, could be made other ways. So let's let's go let's talk let's, let's go into the, uh, the you know the topic today, right? Uh, the disruptions and implications for institution and enterprise and society. We we know this because as we are deploying all these uh, large models to customers, we see deployments issues, we see scalability issues that we have to address. Uh, we we see then uh, all the different kinds of disruptions coming in from social uh, all the way to um, uh, to actually operations and and therefore implications uh, uh, related to governance and so on. That's what I intend to cover today. Okay, generative AI. Right, they are typically built with large language models, and and large language models are a subset of what they call foundation models. I won't cover those today, but we'll we'll cover uh, mainly large language models today. Yeah, they are the basis of generative AI today, and and they they try to mimic the brain, 
in terms of connections, right? I'll, I'll give a quick introduction, five, 10 minute introduction before I go into details, yeah. Um, here you can see, uh, uh, you know, the, try to mimic the brain where the, all the, all the uh, nodes on the right are connected to one of the nodes on the left and so on and so on, right? You can see uh, this is an illustration of how it could be like, right? Yeah, it, uh, the point I'm trying to make here, first point is that it took me um, five minutes to draw 1000 connections here. Right, but uh, those LLMs have hundreds of thousands, billions, ten billion. Some of them uh, a trillion, some more than a trillion, right? Connections out there. So if I were to draw a trillion connections, I'll be one thousand years old. If it took me five minutes to copy and paste here for one thousand connections, so just give give an idea of scale uh, of of these, how how big these models are. And, this, and each of these connections, you can think of them as one number. It's just a very big array, right, uh, of numbers. And these numbers are, are typically called weights. Yeah? How strong is that connection? Is this connection between this word A and word B strong or weak, right, for example? Uh, sometimes they call, call them parameters. Yeah? Uh, so I call them connections uh, in this talk so that we, uh, we make it, uh, we level set it for everyone, yeah. Typically, you you in in you can send it text, for example, and you get text out. It generates text out. That's why it's called generative AI. Right? You give it a prompt, and then it generates text out. And here, uh, I, I will use the OpenAI Chat GPT uh, back in February 2023. 20, a very simple example to explain how this thing works. So I, I just keep in this right. Uh, so this is back in twenty uh, back in February, right? I while in the forest, a deer, and I stopped there, ask for completion. Uh, it, it came up with a beautiful answer. I must emphasize that uh, second point, right, is that uh, this thing, um, um, I did not get this beautiful answer first try, right? I, it was I, I decided to try 20 times and got a sample of uh, 20, almost 20 different answers, right? Uh, 20 different generated prompts in color. And I picked uh, uh, the one I like most, yeah. And the first one was, uh, the, the first uh, response uh, ChatGPT gave was that uh, it was about the deer being chased by a wolf, right? So I thought it wasn't very nice, yeah? So I, I, I picked one that's more calm and serene. That was That's the second point, right? A lot of times when you see a beautiful response, uh, do ask how many tries it took to get there. Se second, third point, right? Uh, it, it, I, the 20 tries I tried, right? It does it word by word. The very next word it predicted uh, were, were nine times uh, out of the 20 were, was the word suddenly, three times out of the 20 was the word uh, appear and so on. And when I picked the, the dash option, right, uh, that, that was, uh, then I sort of zoomed in uh, to that particular option, right? And, and what it does is it takes this next word it has predicted word by word, right? Combined it with the previous prompt, part of the prompt, right? And then send back, sends back the whole thing again uh, through the billions of connection to predict the next word, word by word, right? So that's that third point. Yeah? And then once it predicted that next word, it then takes that next word, combines it with the original prompt again, right? And sends it back through the hundred, uh, billions of connections to predict yet the next word and so on and so on, word by word. So this is the next point I'm making. Other than the fact that a lot of times when you see the response, uh, it may not be the first try uh, that a person did. Uh, and and uh, the, 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 the next point is, is that it does it word by word. Yeah. Later, I'll, I'll cover as to you know, how, how, did, how does something like this, doing word by word, come up with such human-like text? Yeah. We'll, we'll cover that uh, in the second part of this talk. Yeah. Okay, so you put in text, you, you generate text, yeah? You sometimes put in a prompt with text and you generate pictures. Here, uh, let's switch to mid-journey. Uh, in August of uh, last year, uh, someone sent in, uh, wrote up a prompt on the left and created a picture on the right and then submitted it uh, to an art competition and won first prize. So uh, there was a, a, a big controversy, right? Of course, uh, in, in the industry between artists and prompters, right? Uh, as to um, uh, what this means to the industry. And more recently, uh, in February of this year, someone submitted it, uh, did the same thing again and submitted it to the Sony art competition, one of the world leading on, for photography, right? One of the world leading competition, right? And, and also won first prize, yeah. Although uh, that person did not collect the prize ultimately, didn't feel, uh, uh, he, he didn't collect it, yeah. 
Uh, now, um, there was a new term that came up, right? Should these people be called photographers on the right? Or should, it, should they be called promptographers on the left? Yeah. So, uh, or authors or promptographers. So this term came up uh, in the industry. So the, the next, this next point I'm trying to make is that uh, perhaps, uh, you know, it, this is changing industry, right? Changing the way, uh, making people rethink uh, what should they call themselves, uh, uh, the, the job they do, right? Uh, and a and, uh, new term came out, promptography, yeah. Pontographers. Anyway, uh, this is uh, this is mid journey. Of course, there are uh, also cases with uh, Dali uh, and so on in terms of prompting with text, generating pictures. Next, you could be sending in text and then ask the the model uh, to uh, to generate uh, text. Uh, send in pictures and get the model to generate text for you in terms of description. Here, I switched to the uh, Aleph Alpha German model, Luminous, uh, also our customer. Uh, and this is way back in September 2022 when I was up on a hill uh, in, uh, in, in Bonn where Nature, uh, the journal, uh, organized neuroscientists and, and data scientists, model scientists uh, together, model engineers together uh, to try and um, you know, make sure these two groups talk to each other right? as we are moving forward to, to what many would call uh, AGI um, uh, and, and to learn from each other. Uh, and I was in a hotel room up on a hill and, and I looked around, saw an apple, took a picture with my iPhone, right? Uh, this is back in September 22. And I sent it to, to Luminous and it, it told me, you know, apple on a wooden table. I said, you know, uh, pretty reasonable back in September. You know, it, it sort of elaborated uh, the wooden table and just didn't say uh, the apple only. Then I got a bit nasty, right? I, I, I found a glass in a room. I, I tried to confuse it. But let's be fair, right? Uh, humans do make mistakes when they took, take a quick glance at pictures like this too, right? So uh, the mod, what did the model say? The model uh, generated this prompt, an apple and a glass of water. Pretty impressive, didn't, didn't get confused, except for the fact that uh, the line on the glass, right? The, the decorative line on the glass may have confused it um, uh, as uh, thinking it, it is filled with water. But, but uh, let, let's let's be fair, right? I mean, for a human, sometimes we do make that mistake. We can make that mistake too. Then I went all the way out, right? I I, I you know I really tested this thing way back September, right? I mean, uh, Chat GPT version four, right? Uh, is is not available public to do pic, uh, handle pictures yet. But uh, uh, I, I we were doing this in, back in September, and I was already uh, stressing it this way, right? I would like the audience, right, to, to, to guess what it says and then to send in through chat uh, so that I, I get an idea because I do this every time uh, with uh, the audience, right? And, and uh, I'll just pause for a few seconds and you type what you, you think uh, it says in a few words. Eh? Okay, I'm going to show it to you now, right? Okay, uh, this is what it says. Apple juice in a glass. We all got a chuckle, right? Uh, Context-wise, it got it right, right? Apple and glass, apple in glass. Well, you know, and again, to be fair, right? Uh, humans can make a mistake at making a quick glance at this too. The the, the thing I really got me was that uh, as I was engaging with uh, with the CEO of Aleph Alpha, um, he actually said that this, this model, Luminous, has been trained on quite a lot of humor. So we are, we are not quite sure. Right, if if it is actually humoring us, yeah, with this with this response, so uh, so the thing that really got me wasn't the humor part, but the fact that of the phrase we don't know, right? So so what one thing to note about these large language models is a lot of times uh, you could call them uh, somewhat opaque when they, when they make a prediction, make make a uh, generate something, right? Sometimes you can't really explain why. I mean, hey, there is a trillion, uh, in terms of Luminous, they have 200 billion connections, some with a trillion, connect hundreds of billions of connections, right? Uh, there's a lot of work and energy uh, required to, to backtrack these things, you know, to try and figure out what they, what they, uh, what, why they generated this. So, so something to note about, uh, about these models. Yeah. Okay, uh, they are highly energy intensive to train and use, right? So something to, uh, th this one, that's why we come in. And then I say, what's new, right? Uh, CFD is highly energy intensive to, uh, to, uh, to run, right? Uh, weather forecasting, right? Uh, of course, you need to spend that energy so that you can 
forecast weather well uh, to save people, right? Uh, to save property. Um, yes, it is it is necessary. Yeah, but uh, but but what, what's new, right? You you uh, the, we are using supercomputers. Uh, in this case, instead of running physics equations in loops, what we are doing is running uh, the model through lots of text in loops in a hope that it builds enough connections uh, that in the trillion of connection, build enough weights, uh, reliable weights in those connections to make the prediction when you use them, right? So in, in supercomputing, we are, we are used to this. Essentially, we are just taking the skill set we have in scaling a, uh, a model, maybe a physics model or a large language model across multiple uh, uh, GPUs or CPUs, right? And then making sure they run efficiently, both, both in computation as, and, and therefore in energy. So they're highly energy intensive. Let's have a look uh, at uh, what it means, right? So if, if you have a, a server, typically it can handle 100 billion connections. Actually, many tell me it can handle much less, right? But I round it up to 100 billion connections and say, eventually I'll be right when the GPUs get more and more memory, right? I think the, the latest ones will have a, of the order of 100 gigabytes of memory. Uh, eight GPUs will give you uh, almost yeah, uh, a terabyte of memory, right? Um, almost, right? So eventually 100 billion connections will fit in a server. So if you have a 200 billion uh, connection model like, uh, like Aleph Alpha, you need two servers. But actually we need more today, typically four or more, right? Uh, for one model. But let's just say, round it up to uh, you know, pictorially easy to represent. And then if your model is much bigger, let's just say a trillion, right? Uh, you need a high performance fabric. Again, what's new, right? In supercomputing, that's exactly what we do, right? Uh, and then you start scaling with more and more nodes, yeah, and, and so on. The, the thing is, even if you have a 1 trillion, 10 trillion, I even heard of a number of 100 trillion, right? Uh, although it's not a large language model uh, from one of the internet companies that are looking at, uh, they're just building relationships. Uh, you know, to fit all that in, you need a, a large supercomputer for that with enough memory to carry all the connections with each connection carrying a 32-bit number, say, right? Um, but then that's not enough, right? You, you, during the training phase, during the development phase of the model, or during the fine-tuning phase of the model, sometimes you want to have multiple copies of that model. Now, now you start to see why uh, you are talking about 10,000 GPU systems 20,000 GPU system. The biggest we've built is of the order of 30, 40,000 GPU systems, right? And, and, and you know, the size of those systems, and therefore you need to run them efficiently, right? Uh, a 20 megawatt system, right? If you can just squeeze 1% more efficiency out of it, uh, you, you save uh, a lot of energy, yeah. Okay, uh, so where, where 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 are all the energy consumption points are on on you know uh, in in terms of uh, training the model and then running the model in inference mode right uh, in the training phase uh, typically uh, uh, you you work on get building a vocabulary right vocabulary grammar are the two uh, things I, I you know I I use these uh, more common terms vocabulary and basically what does it do. It tries to build a relationship between words. Yeah, so it has a dictionary. Uh, again, dictionary in inverted commas uh, of fifty thousand words, right? And then it needs to build a connection for every word to all the other 4, 49,999 words plus itself, because sometimes words repeat, right? Uh, so if there are fifty thousand connections for each word. Now you can see how big that uh, that network is just for word-to-word -word connection, right? As, at least illustratively. So uh, for example, if you have fed it with a trillion words in, in phrases, sentences, and paragraphs, you, you may have seen that the word dear and bear have a strong link and therefore the weight of it is high because uh, it sees uh, both these words are together quite often, perhaps in a forest, perhaps uh, talking about uh, tracking and so on, right? Uh, and uh, but then uh, perhaps the link from a deer to a fly, uh, as in as in a house fly, right, uh, is is weaker. You still do maybe there are house flies sometimes uh, uh, buzzing around a deer, right? And and someone wrote about it in the trillion words, and you get that link. Yeah, and but uh, deer to a turnip, I was surprised that even though it's weak, it's still pretty reasonable. And I I I was just then wondering when I saw that. So what I did is I just Google inverted commas turnip, inverted commas deer. And it turns out that there are people writing articles about growing turnip to feed deers. Yeah. There you go. 
And then I, I pick one really far out, proprioception is ability in robotics. Uh, we need to learn this uh, for, for humans to be able to get our two fingers to touch with our eyes closed, uh, missing the first time, but not the second time, right? So that's proprioception. So the link between deer and proprioception is weak. Yeah. So this is how it builds it. For every word, it builds a link, 50,000 links, right? Uh, to every other word. And, and the point is to, to, to see enough words from the internet to try and figure out uh, how strong that link should be. Sometimes they use a weight of zero to one, right? Yeah, maybe deer and beer is, uh, deer, deer, uh, so beer, time for a beer. Right? Deer and bear, right? Uh, the, the link is probably 0 0.8 and deer and proprioception, the link is probably 0 0.2 in terms of weight. I'm just guessing. And then, for, uh, and then from there, you get grammar. Right, uh, grammar vocabulary is uh, is a dictionary, uh, and uh, you know, and and then gra uh, get grammar is how to put them in sentences, and automatically you get that capability because uh, uh, in predicting the next word, it it does three things. Okay, remember the next word, it does three things. Firstly, it has this wealth of uh, 50,000 50, 50, links for every word, right, uh, to look look up for. Number two. It can see it has all the words in the prompt you've given it. And number three, it knows how far back each of these words are. It has an embedding for distance also, not just the words. Yeah? And it combines these three uh, in, in some, uh, using some mathematical uh, uh, methods, right? Um, you know, uh, and, and then it comes up uh, with uh, a list of probabilities of what the next word should be. Some words, uh, there will be words of very high probability, words of low probability. If you want, you can have 49,999 probabilities, right? If, you, if the word doesn't repeat. And, and then to, uh, there is an algorithm in there, depending on how you pick the temperature, which is a creativity button that you can turn uh, if you have control, right? Temperature is high, it will, it will randomize a bit more and not always pick the highest uh, probability. Yeah. So this is how it works. Yeah, and, and then of course, uh, next thing, uh, once you train it raw on the internet, uh, it, it might start to talk uh, in ways that it is uh, it is uh, uh, not acceptable. Let's put it this way. So uh, you then have to uh, fine tune it or train it with uh, behavioral methods. Yeah, uh, I call it behavior, but uh, the the technical term that is commonly used, the common method to uh, to do here is called reinforcement learning with human feedback. Uh, this is where you hire a bunch of people, right, to write questions and answers, uh, and and train the model uh, with Q and A, right. So to to to, to try and uh, constrain its behavior to to an area acceptable, right. And next, you then use the Q and A to train a separate uh, uh, reward model. We call it a reward, separate from the LLM, and then you put the uh, and all the reward model does is to grade the answers of the LLM. Then you take the reward model and the LLM and put them in a reinforcement learning way, right? And you, you get the reward model to grade the answers. Yeah, and, uh, and then from there, you do a feedback loop uh, to moderate the behavior further automatically. Because you can't just you, you use humans for this, right? You, you, you just, you're too many humans. We already hired 100 humans to do all this Q&A to start with. Uh, you need a, a, a separate uh, AI system, machine learning system, to grade the answers of the LLM in an automatic reinforcement learning way. Now you're ready to then let uh, the model out in the open, right? And, uh, and individually, when you get a model, assuming it's open source, right? uh, you get the model, assuming the open source model is already pre-trained with vocabulary, grammar, and behavior, you have the model and then you, you yourself fine tune it uh, with your own personality. Right. Uh, currently, it's a lot of work. Right. You you can feed it uh, a bunch of text, uh, but uh, what it really wants in order to fine tune personality, just like behavior, is Q and A again. So there's a lot of manual work. Although uh, there are uh, there are open source uh, effort going on right now called Wizard LM is one example. Wizard LM uh, to try and take a bunch of te document text and then break them up into Q and A for you automatically. So, uh, you know, if, if that, that works well, that would be great, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. So that's, that's typically how, uh, well, and, and every time it does this, right? The billions of connections get fired up. So you have to run through, uh, let's just say you have a trillion connection model. Every time you, you feed something, trillion connections fired up, 
you feed the next word, trillion connection fired up, and so on, right? Because he has to recompute and build relationships, right, uh, in the training process, right? So there is a lot of effort going on uh, to try and optimize this, right? To reduce energy use. So reduce energy use, um, you know, right on top, you will see, uh, of course, you want an, an energy efficient uh, supercomputer. That's why we have been always focused on ESG side of supercomputing, because uh, uh, you have a 10 megawatt system, 10% is one megawatt wasted. If you are 10% inefficient because you want to build it in a, in a much cheaper way, but don't forget, you'll be wasting uh, one megawatt of power, and that, that is money too, right? Uh, and in, in the then in, in terms of energy efficiency, reducing reducing energy use, the central part, you know, the, the, the connection part, uh, there are people talking about uh, trimming connections, right? Uh, just like uh, humans, right? Um, uh, I, I work with the Blue Brain Project and uh, they're trying to model the human brain. And I, I started to, to read up and study on the human brain too. I remember the, the Nature Conference, bringing neuroscientists and uh, model scientists together. Uh, data scientists together, and we learn from each other. Apparently, from our ages of three to 30 years old, our brain connection, our synapses get pruned uh, when we are not using it, yeah, right? So so uh, it's important, and I'm already past that age, uh, that window, but uh, uh, for those not, uh, it's good to uh, keep your brain active, right? Uh, don't let those connections get pruned away that you need, uh, you may need. Okay, so pruning is going on. People are thinking about it. People are also doing uh, adaptive firing. Don't have to fire all 1 trillion connections uh, when you're doing this, right? Maybe you have a mixture of experts, a term MOE, right? Uh, and, and you then categorize your, your connections based on the type of expertise uh, you want to activate. And then based on the prompt, you activate the right set of expertise and not all of them. And, and therefore you save energy. Then, then, of course, uh, on the behavioral side, uh, uh, you, people are talking about LoRa, L-O-R-A, look it up, uh, to find better methods of fine-tuning. Okay. And then finally, uh, scope for governance. This is on the uh, mainly on the output side, but input side too, right? Uh, and for, for those in institutions and enterprises, uh, for example, let, 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 me, let me describe it best by what we did, right? When... We started working on generative AI or building system for generative AI way back 2019, 2018, right? Uh, although we can't talk about them because of, of NDA and we still can't talk about them, right? But uh, we can say that we started uh, way back then, right? Uh, well before, right? Um, uh, because they, they, they need supercomputers to do this, right? And, and the people who have been building this for decades, right, are us. Anyway, um, uh, what... What, what did we do as an uh, as an enterprise? The first thing we did was set up uh, an, a governance board for AI, right? Make a team of people. Next thing, build a website, which is the one stop shop go to, right, for all the questions uh, about AI in the company. And then next, set up a training for all employees uh, touching AI, right? Uh, very uh, to start with, uh, you know, basic training so that people level set everybody. Right? And then to, uh, have forms that uh, people fill, especially if we need to vet uh, working with uh, partners on, on certain AI software. Right? So, so this, is, uh, this, is how, uh, this is what we did in terms of governance. First thing, uh, set up a board, build a website, one-stop shop right? uh, for, for all the questions there, uh, and, and set up training for, uh, for the employees. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, then... The other thing is on the output side, right? Uh, people are thinking about uh, governance. So I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have time to do a workshop on governance, but I'll just quickly run through them. So on the output side, you know, uh, of course, what's new, right? Um, in manufacturing, production line, you do QA, QA, quality assurance. You need to do the same. You have to set up uh, how you're going to test this thing so that you are comfortable. But it's not going to be just technical people doing this. You know, bring in your HR people. Bring in your um, uh, bring in sociologists. Right? Of course, you'll have your uh, data engineer, uh, data scientists, uh, machine learning um, um, uh, engineers, and so on in there uh, to build a QA system for it. Um, next, uh, if you are worried, right? Which many people do, uh, they put a front filter as well as a back filter, 
right? You will see uh, that in many of these uh, chat uh, chatbots, right? Uh, uh, sometimes when you you really test it with some some extreme uh, questions, it will actually respond to you and and say, "I am sorry, I cannot answer that question for the following reasons." Yeah, right. Uh, so that's the front filter. So uh, you know we've had sentiment analysis, uh, you know. More, more basic uh, NLP uh, system, National Language Processing System, uh, that, that can do sentiment analysis. You can put those as the filter in front and, and assess the sentiment of the response by the LLM uh, and, and then put a, a, a guard rail in front of it. Yeah? And then at the back, uh, you could also do the same, right? Bring in sociologists, your HR uh, people to look at the training data or the fine-tuning data and vet it at the front end. Um, the other concerns that keep coming up is, uh, of course, uh, you know, what to do with fake mitigation, uh, fakes, right? Uh, produce uh, uh, and, and then causing confusion in the industry. Um, fake mitigation is becoming um, a, a, a topic talked about a lot, and, and uh, there are people actually investing uh, in, in this mitigation effort. Um, a few points about this, right? I mean, the journalists doing fact check will have uh, a lot more work in their hands these days. Right? How are they going to deal with this? Right? For example, journalists doing fact checking. So one, one uh, there was one suggestion that perhaps they should crowdsource uh, fact checking also. So all these ideas are starting uh, starting to come up. Yeah. Um, there, there is also a, a, a question as to can you train a bot a bot to recognize itself? Yeah, there have been examples of uh, of that being uh, a lot of false positives in that. Right, uh, blaming the the innocent. Right, uh, you know, uh, I think I think there was one um, one case of um, uh, assessment papers, right, uh, being put through, uh, and and the checking bot actually says uh, it was produced by by another bot, right, Wrong, wrongly accusing, so uh, wrongly stating. I shouldn't use the word accusing. Wrongly stating that it's possibly a a, a, a bot that produced it. So. Uh, there, currently, there are lots of false positives. What's new again, right? I mean, you know, uh, there is this knob, right? I shouldn't say what's new, but uh, there's this knob, right? Uh, you, when your accuracy isn't good enough, they will get better. Yeah, you, you either turn it high on false negatives or turn it all high on false positives, right? Uh, uh, and and this this knob, right, uh, is something that you you have to deal with at the early phases until the models get smart enough you know, uh, to be accurate. Um, there, there's also a question about watermarking, right? With, with no watermarking in, in PDF documents and all, although every time you come up with a watermarking approach, uh, uh, you know, someone else tries to defeat it, right? Um, uh, can, can you train your model, right? Uh, in the in pre-training phase with all the internet data um, uh, you know, to 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 leave a a watermark, a signature in the model, so that when it responds, uh, and when you get enough of a response from it, you 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 run a statistical analysis, and you can recognize which bot it came from, right? Things like that. Or if it was interfered with, uh, then uh, you there is a signature uh, of the interference. Yeah. But the bottom line is that it now, in fact, the bigger worry is, is that it puts a bigger burden now on the truth. Right? Right, so so after a while, people will will start to question what they see, and then when something is truth, so there is bigger burden on 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 proving that something is true, but it's all all part of the process, right? We have to now build tools uh, that can mitigate uh, uh, these these outcomes yeah, that uh, that are undesirable, desirable. Uh, and fi and finally, second second finally, uh, society. Right, you from society you get policy. From policy you may get regulations, right? Uh, and then from regulations you you again go back to society because um, you may have regulations. You know, as I always say, what's correct is not always the right thing to do, because uh, society at that time uh, may feel differently, right? So, so there are you know there is this this um, uh, this dynamics going on. Um, I, I, you know, in, in terms of society and social acceptance, right? Um, on one hand, certain things, certain technologies get get incorporated and accepted and used very quickly, the internet. But on the other hand, there are certain technologies that take a long time and it's still not fully accepted. Example, autopilot, 
right? I, I work with NASA and, and uh, automated system is so important remote on Mars and Moon that I, 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 I learned this from them, right? Autopilot has, has been around 100 years, but it is only allowed uh, during cruise, right? Very seldom during landing and not during taxi and takeoff, right? So it's, and we still want two pilots uh, in the plane. But the other area is uh, autonomous vehicles, right? Uh, level five autonomy um, will be a while yet. Yeah? Um, you know, a lot of people say autonomous cars are here, but uh, don't forget they're level zero, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah? Go check S SAE uh, five levels of autonomy and you can see that list, uh, what it means, yeah? Uh, for, for, for those interested, interested very, uh, very quickly, right? Level one is autonomy uh, for cars is that it can get your foot off. Level two is where you can also get your hands off. Level three is where you can get your eyes off, but your mind still is on, still is on. And only at level four can you have your foot, hands, eyes, and mind off, right? But only for certain roads. And only at level five do you have everything. You know? So uh, I, I, some say it's here, but I, I believe it's still quite a way for level five. Mm. Even if te technically we achieve it, right? Uh, socially, uh, could be an issue uh, in terms of uh, acceptance. Right. Uh, early cases, um, we've seen, um, you know, some can call it a landmark case in which the U.S. Patent Trademark Office, uh, made, uh, U.S. Uh, Trademark Office made a stand, right? Someone uh, created a beautiful storybook, beautiful, right? Uh, and with a very beautiful story time, uh, storyline, each of these images, though, were created by Mid Journey with, with beautiful, with, with very great effort in prompting it, right? Submitted it uh, for, uh, for copyright, right? And uh, the final judgment by the US uh, Trademark Copyright Office, the Copyright Office, was the following We will give you copyright for the entire picture book and the storyline, but we cannot give you copyright for each of those individual images created by Mid Journey because they were not. Uh, the result of human authorship. That's the phrase, right? Yeah. And that judgment was only just recently, February of 2023, this year. Right? Uh, so will this change when, when people say, you know, I've spent more effort in prompting to get this picture than I actually, than the time needed to draw this picture? What happens then? One. Two, if I have taken the model on the left here, through vec after getting vocabulary, grammar, and behavior, I spent 20 years personalizing it, that it becomes like me, that I'm even confident enough for it to represent me in a very restricted sense. Some even talking about giving it power of attorney, right? And that I'm going to leave it as a legacy when I'm, I leave this world yeah, uh, to represent me. I mean, this is the kind of thinking some of the... Uh, uh, ultra high net worth individuals, right? Uh, I think I, I know of uh, uh, one or two of them, right? All right. Um, then, if it is a highly personalized bot and it generated something, can you copyright it for for that person? So, so again, right? So these are things that are questions that uh, perhaps we've never asked before that we are asking now because we are changing uh, the world is changing because of this. I imagine, right? You, you, you have a bot you grew up with that you've been personalizing. Uh, you, you know, you download uh, you know an open source model, pre-train, right, uh, and behavioral train, and then you start accompanying it for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Right. Uh, the question is, uh, will, will that model be uh, be really like you and answer the way you would? So that's uh, you know something to think about. And people are thinking seriously about that, right? Although it costs a lot of money to, to, to train these models, especially if you want to take a trillion parameter model or connection model to start with. But, you know, uh, you know, a 20 billion one, an open source 20 billion one is still uh, pretty reasonable if you train it with enough data. So some say, you know, smaller model with lots more data sometimes can be equivalent to a bigger model with less data, right? Ratio wise, yeah. Anyway, uh, and then finally, uh, you know, perhaps these, these models, just like computer games, will get uh, a PG rating, right? We'll get a rating with parental guidance, parental control. Yeah. Um, again, right? Um, these kinds of thinking, 
uh, are, are something that is uh, prompting, um, no pun intended, prompting us, right, humans, right, to to rethink, right, because uh, LLMs are are so powerful currently. I'll I'll end here. Uh, Hartem, I think uh, I'm, I'm up on time, right? I have one more slide, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll just pause here. Let me know, Hartem, should I carry on or we, yeah. we go to Q&A? Yeah. Uh, I think we can enter the Q&A at this time. Thank okay. you so much, uh, yeah. Anglin, for the great presentation. Uh, you're giving really justice to, uh, to this uh, really timely topic. And it was uh, very um, interesting uh, for all of us. Um, so let's see, we have time for one or two questions. We already have yeah. one. Uh, I think, uh, let me read it. Uh, loudly. Um, so how do the sociologist or any domain expert have the time to vet the input? When I yeah. thought these models require massive you know, amounts of data. Yeah, that's a great question, right? I mean, uh, in the same way in the behavioral and uh, behavioral uh, uh, fine tuning phase, you know, we, we kind of fought to keep hiring people to, to check uh, the answers, right? That's why we build a bot to do so. So I think at the very least, uh, you you categorize them and uh, and and look at the bulk data. Let me just show you uh, uh, what uh, GPT three, yeah, uh, uses in the pre training phase of. Uh, so they use uh, web text, uh, two two sets of books, digital books, and Wikipedia, right? Um, common crawl is a popular one for those uh, interested. Let me see. Can I click on common crawl here? Uh, yeah, I can't reach my my menu uh, because of, yeah, okay. Uh, this is Common Crawl. Common Crawl is made up of uh, uh, three billion web pages, you know, four hundred terabytes. So, so of course we won't be going through word by word, right? Uh, of what you pre-train the model with, you can't, right? What you can do is have sociologists come in and advise us after understanding uh, what we're going to feed them. Right, you can see the percentages on the right, right? And then uh, let, let's pick another one, right? Uh, the PAL data set is, uh, is made up of even more complex, right? So some other models are trained, uh, not unlike uh, GPT 3.5, are uh, trained with GitHub, uh, PubMed, Law, US Patent Trademark Office, and so on. So it, it, is, it is important for a sociologist at least to come with you, right? To make an assessment as to are you too heavy on this and too light and too light on that, because you're going to skew things, right? All right, uh, and at, at the very least, right? Uh, have a sociologist, or uh, you know, sometimes uh, if you instead of hiring a sociologist, you 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 ask someone uh, suitable from HR to come help you uh, to at least give some input uh, during this stage. I hope that's a useful answer. Oh, uh, of course, uh, let, let me, there is also another area. Let me just uh, come back to uh, uh, my, um, yeah. Um, of course, uh, there is a, uh, and of course, on, on the left here, the behavioral analysis, you need, you can have a sociologist, right? Vetting the 500 questions and answers. Uh, you know uh, that that are produced by these uh, 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 humans, right? That uh, you hire to to construct them, to craft them. So at the behavior stage, it's easier because it is done by humans anyway. So as those questions are crafted, you get guidance from a sociologist or someone from um, uh, in, in the social sciences, right? But in the vocabulary and grammar stage, where you are taking terabytes of data, um, you you work with categories. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Then I take the, the the last question because we're running a bit uh, out of time. Okay. Um, so I've noticed more concerns and focus on the source of training data, specifically concerns from the creative communities who feel it, it is not fair to have their public work used for training. Do you yeah. foresee upcoming regulations, legal challenges, etc., for training data? Mm. Yeah, and with these are questions, I, I must say, uh, both sides, there are both sides, right, uh, in the argument. Turns out both sides are our customers, right? Uh, and and um, um, uh, on, on one side, right, uh, the argument, as you uh, rightly stated, right, they are, they, are, they are creations, human creations were used for training the model, and the model absorbed the essence, right, uh, of, of that creation. 
so that it can produce uh, similar works. Right? Um, on, on the other uh, on the side, our argument uh, is that um, uh, in, in copyright law, uh, I'm not an expert here, but uh, my understanding is uh, there is a certain level of use as long as you do not, uh, as, as, as long as you modify it uh, enough uh, that it, it is less of the original now, right? So I, I can't state it well, but uh, there is a certain level of use allowed uh, for copyrighted work. Um, again, I must emphasize I'm not uh, uh, the expert in this area, but uh, I do hear these two sides of the argument. And then, of course, um, the because we are now in the transition phase, right, where these models are quite raw, they are trained with raw data, they have done some level of behavioral uh, uh, modifications, right? But the personality level is very low now. Some many of these models, like ChatGPT, are, are not fine-tuned uh, with with your data, right? Uh, except for the context window, which I didn't cover today. Where if you have a hundred a context window of hundred thousand words, say, you can actually put all your documents in the front end before you start prompting. Pre-pen your prompt with a hundred uh, with uh, with ninety thousand words, right, uh, of your uh, information before you start your prompt, and then you already start personalizing it somewhat. But what I'm trying to make is that we are in the early phase where personalization is still uh, very low, where most of the, the generation generation from these uh, generative AI models, those output right from these generative AI models are reliant on the, on the raw data only, mainly. But going forward, there'll be more and more personalization. So the big question is, as I said, right, after 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of personalization, um, what is the model, right? It has learned grammar and vocabulary and artwork from somewhere, but it has gone through, you know, decades of personalization. So again, you know, we are talking about these two extremes, but uh, the, the, is the difficulty here uh, for these two groups, both, well, and of course, uh, you know, fully support uh, creative works and so on, right? Um, but the, the key thing, the, the key thing is that we are in the early phases where things are, are less clear. But as these things get uh, highly personalized, um, you know, the, the question, the, 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 the discussion may change. And if you allow me, there is uh, another question, last one from Nanta Teacher. Just before we go ahead and answer that one, I just want to remind the attendees there is a link for the survey, if you don't mind uh, giving us your feedback. Here's the question of Nanta Kishore, which is also very interesting. Has there been any thought on criteria to determine if this kind of models can become self-aware? Particularly yeah. for the example yeah. you gave regarding potentially decades of data invested in a model. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Self-aware, AGI, super intelligence. Uh, uh, this, this is a hot topic, right, uh, of, of the uh, very long-range thinkers, right? Um, the difficulty of this is, is I, I work with neuroscientists, right, uh, um, for years, for decades, right. Um, difficulty of this is is we don't even have an agreed upon intelligence, uh, agreed upon definition of human intelligence. You, you ask ten different experts, you get probably five different answers, right? Uh, should IQ test be the the mark? And by the way, uh, uh, one of the models was tested through uh, IQ tests and uh, one of the IQ tests only on the uh, verbal part and not on two other parts. And he got a score of 130 right, relative to a, a college grad of 110, right? But uh, the other two parts were, were not tested. But, but, but some say the verbal part is highly correlated with the other two anyway. But we don't have a definition of in, uh, what intelligence is. So for, for me, I, uh, there, are, there are three levels, right? Sentience, consciousness, self-awareness, right? That will be the highest level. You know, self-awareness, uh, in fact, uh, we, uh, when we are, I think before 18 months old, or maybe a bit younger, uh, we, we don't pass the uh, red dot on forehead in front of mirror tests. Yeah? Uh, in, in chimpanzees uh, pass that, right? And certain other, one or two other mammals actually uh, pass that. Very rare, right? Uh, we, we only get self-aware ourselves, right? Uh, as we get older. Um, so self-aware is really high. So the first question is uh, sentience, right? Um, you know, let, let's see whether you can get sentience, feeling, right? Uh, second question uh, is consciousness. What, what, actually, what is consciousness, right? 
So actually, I've been studying uh, Professor Roger Penrose's uh, opinion on this, uh, Nobel laureate, uh, uh, black holes physics, but uh, he has a different thinking about, uh, look, look him up, yeah, orchestrated uh, uh, objective reduction, right? Uh, um, we, this topic is still um, being uh, debated, yeah, uh, tremendously, neuroscientists, data scientists, and so on. Um, but uh, there is a group that is very optimistic that we'll, we'll get to AGI, uh, um, artificial general intelligence, and then move on from there um, uh, in, in, within, within a few decades. Yeah. Some say we are far off uh, from it. Right. Uh, ten, uh, let's just say you got, uh, our brain have a, of the order of, uh, say, a thousand trillion synapses. We are now at a hundred trillion. Let's just say we can build a system that can carry a hundred trillion. Um, there's a lot of energy required to fire up 100 trillion uh, connections each time, right? Right. Uh, uh, let's just say you get to 1,000 trillion. Then you think you are equivalent to the complexity of brain. Actually, uh, in terms of the Blue Brain Project, uh, I, I've worked with them. Each synapse is not represented by one number. Each synapse, right, of the 1,000 trillion, right, is represented by five uh, uh, ordinary differential equations in order to model it. Yeah. Now, maybe you should get more efficient, right? But, uh, but uh, you know, on one hand, we think we'll get there quickly. But on the other hand, you see uh, the evidence that uh, it may not be that soon. Well, we're glad that uh, supercomputing and HPC resources are critical in, in all this subject, right? And, uh, yeah, we, well, need, we, need, uh, we need green energy to run these things. Green energy as well. I mean, the yeah. biggest systems are of the order 20 megawatts, 30 megawatts, right? And that's one yeah, system. Yeah. Yeah, so right. so uh, we are we are building systems that uh, would use totally uh, renewable and green energy. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, mm -hmm. let's thank you again, uh, uh, Dr. Anglim Go. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for giving us uh, this great uh, webinar.